I'm Emma. It's nice to see all these faces. I don't know anyone because I'm in UCSF world, but hello. I'm going to talk a little bit about pulmonary hypertension in pediatrics. And there's a lot of overlap in, a, in adult pulmonary hypertension, and there's a lot of stuff that's very specific to pediatrics. So I try, I'm trying to highlight some of the specifics for pediatrics. But just to begin, kind of just what is pulmonary hypertension? It's, kind, it's a hemodynamic, structural, and functional disease. Um, the definition of pulmonary hypertension is that the mean pulmonary artery pressure is greater than 25 um, at rest. And that's measured by uh, right heart catheterization. So that's an invasive procedure that you have to get that measurement from. In pediatrics, there's some debate whether it should be a percentage um, value since neonates can get pulmonary hypertension and sometimes their mean pulmonary arterial pressure might not be above 25. But the percentage of their systemic pressure is very elevated. But that's still in debate. So the definition still remains that it's greater than 25. And also, um, another definition would be that your pulmonary vascular resistance is greater than 3. Um, it's a structural disease in that there's just the vasculature itself is abnormal. And, and functionally, there's impaired constriction and relaxation. And as the disease progressive, this progresses, it gets worse. Um, and you'll see that in the next couple slides. So all of this is a problem because it increases the right ventricular afterload. And really, pulmonary hypertension is a disease of right ventricular failure, ultimately. Um, the increased pulmonary vascular resistance and there's decreased compliance and overall leads to this increased impedance and then to right heart failure. So you see dilation and hypertrophy on echocardiogram. And also, you can see de decreased function on echo. And ultimately, it leads to death. And it's a progressive um, fatal disease. It's a terrible disease to have. You don't want a patient with it. But they are getting it anyways. And um, this little picture down here is the first heart, heart on the left is a normal heart. And then the heart on the right, you can see how big and boggy the right ventricle is and how um, dilated it is. And as it stretches out, it just doesn't squeeze as well. So ultimately, they die of right heart failure. And this is a, just a short axis echo. These top three um, images are, is a normal heart in systole. So you can see this nice round. This is the left ventricle. And the right ventricle kind of nicely wraps around the left ventricle. You can see that the left ventricle is much more, um, has much more muscle than the right ventricle because it has to squeeze against the systemic vascular resistance. The right ventricle is built to, to squeeze against very low pressures, which the, the pulmonary um, system is usually a very low pressure system. Um, and then this is a you know, severe pulmonary hypertension patient. You can see that the right ventricle is much bigger than the left. And you can see how hypertrophied it is because the muscle is having to build because it's squeezing against such high pressure. And it actually impedes on the left ventricular um, volume. So the left ventricular diastolic volume, it can't fill because the right ventricle is just pushing on it. So it's a problem that the right ventricle is having a problem pushing against the pulmonary pressure. And it's also a problem because the left ventricle can't fill and it's having a problem getting enough cardiac output. So there's uh, some classifications of pulmonary hypertension. There's five groups. Um, the first classification is pulmonary arterial hypertension. And a lot of people ask what the difference between PAH and PH is. And this is where that definition comes from. So in uh, group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension, this is your idiopathic pulmonary hypertension um, related to congenital heart disease, um, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Um, and then group two, there's, there's several definitions. And I'm giving the most common ones we see in pediatrics. Sorry. This is really small. But you have, um, there's a lot of associated with connective tissue disease, HIV, portal hypertension. But in Pediatrics, we see a lot with congenital heart disease and a lot with pulmonary, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Group two um, is owing to left heart disease. And this in, we rarely see in pediatrics. You see that much, much more in adults. So I'm not going to talk much about that in this talk. Um, we, the other big group we see it in is this group three, which is owing to lung disease. So that's uh, sleep disordered breathing, um, which is like obstructive sleep apnea, which we see especially in obese uh, pediatrics. Um, and then developmental abnormalities like CDH and um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And 
that group is actually kind of the fastest growing group in pediatric pulmonary hypertension because preemies are living longer and having these um, detrimental problems later. And also the babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia are living longer just because surgical technique is, is getting better and perioperative care is getting better. And a lot of that group of patients has pulmonary hypertension. And if you guys don't know, um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia are babies that are born with a hole in their diaphragm. And so their abdominal contents grows in their chest, um, in their thoracic cavity when they're in utero. And what happens is the lung on that side where the hole is in their diaphragm, the lung doesn't develop as much. So that lung is small, and that's why they develop pulmonary hypertension. There's also a group five, which is unclear multifactorial mechanisms. Oh, and I forgot group three, four, which is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, which is a bunch of little clots that clog up the pulmonary system. But that's also something we don't see very often in pediatrics. We do, but it's much um, more rare. So a little bit about congenital heart disease and pulmonary hypertension, just because this is pediatric specific, is um, there's, these are some examples of congenital heart disease that have both increased pulmonary pressure and blood flow. So truncus arteriosus, you can see that the, there's a lot of increased pressure and a lot of increased blood going to the lungs. Um, here you can see that. Uh, the pulmonary arteries see as much as high pressure and as much blood flow as the um, aorta sees. So that's too much for the pulmonary arteries. Um, an AV canal defect, there's a huge hole joining the two ventricles. Again, the pulmonary arteries see way too much pressure and flow. And then there's variable alterations in the amount of pulmonary pressure and flow you can get with different defects. And you can see there's, there's a wide range, like a VSD is going to see a lot more pressure and flow than just an ASD, where the hole is in the upper chambers. Um, and the same with the PDA, you still see extra flow, but it's much less than you know the defects that I just showed on the prior slide. So what happens is there's these pulmonary vascular changes secondary, secondary to this increased uh, pulmonary blood flow. So first, there's this there's actually a shear stress to the endothelial cells in the pulmonary arteries. So there's a lot of pressure and a lot of extra flow, and it's it's actually a shear stress, stress to those cells. And as a reaction, there's kind of medial, medial hypertrophy of the pulmonary arteries. So they just build muscle, and they actually decrease the size of the, the uh, lumen of the artery. So you can see that the pressure just then gets higher, and it's harder for the blood to uh, flow through them. So there's this muscularization of the small arteries, and then there's a loss of peripheral arteries. So the, pr the pulmonary arterial system is very much like a tree, and you can think about the branches first disappearing, and then the small little twigs, and then it gets bigger and bigger. So they call it pruning. And when you look at a pulmonary angiogram, and I wish I had one on here, of a pulmonary hypertension patient, you can really see it. It can be really dramatic. And that's progressive as it goes on. So this little um, chart is kind of it explains how the different increased blood flow risks for different con congenital heart disease defects. So with a truncus, your risk of pulmonary vascular disease is 100% if you're not repaired, if you're repaired greater than two years. So I guess I'm saying it wrong. But if you're less than two years unrepaired truncus, you have a 100% chance of having pulmonary vascular disease. With an AV canal, at about two years, you're looking at 100% chance of pulmonary vascular disease. With a VSD, it's more like 15 to 20%, and that happens usually greater than two years. A PDA, 15 to 2 20%, also greater than two years. Uh, transposition with a VSD, you have like a 70 to 100% chance uh, between one and two years of age. And an ASD, about a 20% chance. But that's greater than 20 years of age. So you can see the timing of repair is really important for pulmonary hypertension in, in pediatrics, because the longer you wait with that much extra blood flow and that much extra pressure on the pulmonary arteries, the worse disease you're going to have. And if you repair them early enough, you can actually reverse the disease process. And then there's a point where you can't reverse the disease process. And then it's really very, very difficult to repair, if at all, if you can repair it at all. Um, and these patients are really high risk around the longer um, delayed their surgery is. Their post-operative and perioperative course is very, very tenuous. And they can die perioperative from pulmonary hypertension as well. So another thing that's um, specific to pediatrics is this persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. And this occurs when the pulmonary vascular resistance remains elevated after birth. 
and it results in a right to left shunt of blood through the fetal circulation, which is the PFO and PDA. And so the baby's very, very hypoxic. Um, so this is the pulmonary arterial pressure is very high in utero, and when the baby takes the first breath, it becomes a very low pressure system. And for some reason, this, these babies don't transition well. And this pressure stays really, really high. And so the blood keeps shunting across the wrong direction, across the PFO and across the PDA. So there's blue blood going out to the body, and the baby's very hypoxic. Um, it occurs primarily in term or late term preterm infants, um, greater than 34 weeks gestation. And it's caused by abnormalities, abnormalities of the pulmonary vasculature that in, include underdevelopment, maldevelopment, and maladaption. So underdevelopment would be like lung hypoplasia. Maldevelopment would be normal growth, but there's, there's abnormal thickening of the pulmonary arterial musculature. And maladaption is there's just abnormal vasoconstriction that's in, interfering with that normal postnatal fall in PBR. So these are some examples of different categories. So if you have abnormal parenchyma, like an increased vasoconstriction, that would be like your MEC aspirate baby. So there's, a, um, there's an actual an irritant that's causing increased vasoconstriction. Uh, respiratory distress syndrome and pneumonia, those all can cause this uh, PPHN. If you have normal parenchyma but increased vasoconstriction, you're looking at there's already remodeled pulmonary vasculature, and that's idiopathic PPHN, which can happen as well. Hypoplastic vasculature, um, plus or minus increased vasoconstriction would be like the congenital diaphragmatic hernia babies that we talk about. And then there's some irreversible kinds of uh, pulmonary hypertensive uh, hypertension that then there's nothing you can do for that baby except for to um, withdraw support. So this is specifically towards pediatric, I mean, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn management, but it actually applies to really most pediatric pulmonary hypertension management. Um, you're always going to give uh, supplemental oxygen. It's oxygen's a pulmonary vasodilator, so it's like a medicine for pulmonary hypertension. And, and initially, it should always be administered at 100%. And then you can wean it down, but you always want to keep your PaO2 maintained between 50 to 90% and your SATs greater than 90%. This is really critical in the ICU when you have a patient with pulmonary hypertension. Some people can kind of poo-poo just a desaturation, but in pulmonary hypertension, this can really spiral them and put them over the edge. And you really, it's really important to leave, I mean, make sure that their saturations are greater than 90% if you can. Uh, you want to mechanically ventilate these patients because you want to maintain their uh, CO2s between 35 and 40. Hypercarbia and acidosis both increase PVR. So again, you can get into trouble really, really quickly if um, you're not paying attention to that. You want to maintain adequate circulation. Um, if you have low blood systemic blood pressure, you basically increase that right to left shunt because the pressure is really, really high in the pulmonary system. And as your systemic system is continuing to drop, then you just have an increase in shunting uh, to your systemic system. So you really want to provide sufficient vascular volume and use inotropic agents to, to help the squeeze of the heart and your systemic vascular resistance. The other thing is, like I showed you that picture of the echo where the left heart is just being smashed. I mean, it really needs help to get that cardiac output up. Um, you want to maintain adequate sedation. Uh, agitation causes this catecholamine release, and that also increases p uh, your PVR. So you always want to give morphine or fentanyl if you can. Um, someone asked to try to include some pediatric outcomes da data, which there is very, very minimal. Um, there's one report from the UK in 2010, which was the UK is interesting because they have a single referral center for pediatric pulmonary hypertension in the country, so they have an opportunity to really see all their patients from that population. The survival of pediatric idiopathic pulmonary hypertension was 89, 84, and 75% at one year, three years, and five years. And that's with treatment. So without treatment, the, it's thought that the survival rate for pediatrics is like six to 12 months. But Jeff Feynman, um, and a gentleman from uh, Denver, which is another major center, kind of started this pediatric pulmonary hypertension network, um, which is PPHNet. And it's been now created, and it's right now it's involving the 10 largest pediatric pulmonary hypertension centers in North America, so US and Canada. And everyone is inputting data into this registry. So it's going to be the largest pulmonary hypertension registry, but we're really not going to have outcomes. Any